Good afternoon, and the sitting is resumed, and it's time for questions to the Minister of Justice. And just to inform uh, members that uh, questions 4, 5 and 7 and questions 6 and 9 are grouped. Questions 10 and 11 have been withdrawn. And there are some topicals, but we'll deal with that at the time. So I call Ms. Katrina Rian. Question number one, Leda Hall. Principal Deputy Speaker, the judgment from the Scottish Appeal Court in the Dugan and Wood case is referred to in Chapters 8 and 9 of the consultation paper, and readers are particularly requested to address in their response a provision for conscientious objection and how it should be formulated. Although the case is now in the Supreme Court and the ruling is not expected until next year, the consultation paper makes clear my intention that draft legislation should take full cognizance of the need for clarity and certainty in any provision for right to refuse to participate in terminations of pregnancies on the grounds of conscience. And Ms. Rian for supplementary. Good. And in, in light of, uh, thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. And in light of the fact that obviously this judgment will set legal precedent, um, I wonder: has the minister, will the minister commit to extending the consultation period, if necessary, to take account of any judgment? As you know, the consultation period ends on 17th of January. I'm not sure it's either necessary or appropriate to extend the period. Principal Deputy Speaker, specifically the Supreme Court has been asked to judge on the basis of the current legislation as it applies in Great Britain, which is not therefore directly relevant to any proposal for legislation that we might be introducing in this jurisdiction. Uh, the reality is we are at a relatively early stage of any legislative process and we're not in anything like the same position of concerns being raised about the operation of the current GP legislation. And I call Mr Paul Given. Well, Deputy Speaker, the Minister should be aware of a case in November last year where the Court of Appeal uh, overturned uh, a decision taken by Justice Tracy in respect of a uh, request for an inquest that the Attorney General uh, instructed the senior coroner to carry out, but he rejected that request. Uh, given that the Justice Tracy in the first instance um, said that to allow the Attorney General's uh, case to be won, it would have implications for abortion. Uh, seeing that the Court of Appeal overturned that decision and uh, the Attorney General won the case and sets a landmark precedent which conferred the rights of personhood on the unborn child in those circumstances, what cognizance is being taken uh, by the Minister within his consultation document so that this landmark decision is properly upheld? Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, the answer is the consultation document contains information on the proposals which are being put forward for change or potential change in the law. It is for those who wish to comment on it to raise the concerns that they might have, and the Department will fully consider any responses. Clearly, there are potential issues arising from a number of legal cases, but if we held up all consultations as part of a legislative process until all matters were settled in the Supreme Court, we would never consult on anything. And thank you very much, uh, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. I thank the Minister for his answer. Uh, would the Minister reassure the House, indeed reassure those involved in nursing, uh, particularly midwives, that whatever uh, legislation is finally produced, that the right to conscientious objection in the performance of any abortion uh, will be safeguarded? Well, Mr McGuinness raises a very serious point. The reality is, at the present time in Northern Ireland, in those small number of abortions which are lawful to protect the life uh, of uh, the woman, there is no grounds of conscience to withdraw because it is that kind of procedure. Uh, certainly, I would see no prospect that there will be legislation in this jurisdiction which would have grounds of conscience any less than the grounds of conscience which exist under the 1967 Act for England, Wales and Scotland. I call Mr. Kieran McCarthy. Thank you very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Can the Minister clarify beyond any doubt that he is, he is strictly limited and that he's not advocating, as has been suggested in some quarters, that the um, uh, promotion of the abortion, 1967 Abortion Act will be brought to Northern Ireland? Well, yes, Principal Deputy Speaker, I'm very happy to give that confirmation. I know there are those who have suggested that I am in favour of abortion on demand to the point of birth. That is a complete fabrication. The consultation is around an extremely narrow area. 
looking at fatal fetal abnormality where doctors certify that there is no prospect of life and no life-saving treatment could be given after delivery and also raises the question around rape and incest. It is a very far way from the way the law currently operates across the water and there is no intention on the part of the Department of Justice to go anywhere near the 1967 Act. Thank you. And I call Mr Chris Little. Question number two. Since it was first launched in 2011, the Assets Recovery Community Scheme has awarded over £2.1 million to nearly 200 projects which meet the statutory criteria of fighting crime or the fear of crime. The scheme supported include diversionary activities for young people, making older people more secure in their own homes, and projects aimed at reducing drug and alcohol abuse. The projects are based throughout Northern Ireland and are benefiting both urban and rural areas. The emphasis is on encouraging new, innovative projects. It is a great satisfaction that not only are these projects benefiting the community, but they're also being funded through assets recovered from criminals. Mr Little, for a supplementary. Thank you, Minister, for his response. And I welcome the fact that over £2 million of criminal assets have been redirected to community projects under this Minister for Justice. Would the Minister for Justice agree that this is an encouraging example of devolved policing and justice powers working to tackle organised crime and for the benefit of community development here in Northern Ireland? Uh, yes, Principal Deputy Speaker, I would agree. The reality is that it's only since the 1st of April 2011, since devolution, that we persuaded the Treasury to enable Northern Ireland to access 100% of Northern Ireland criminal confiscation receipts. Previously, it was only 50%. And whilst the agreement is tacked at 10 million pounds, capped at 10 million pounds per year, and is potentially time limited to the current CSR period, I believe we've shown very positive results from it. Uh, it's unfortunate it's not perhaps slightly more flexible, but nonetheless, 2.1 million pounds, not just 2 million, 2.1 million pounds, uh, is, is an extremely positive statement of good work being done in every part of this community, principally through PCSPs and agencies of the justice system, but all very much to the good of communities right across Northern Ireland. I call Mr Mickey Brady. Colonel Mayagot, uh, Las Concordia. Can the Minister provide some information as to the process by which this money um, is allocated from this fund? And is there anything the Minister can do to ensure that money, more money from this fund actually goes to projects outside of Belfast? Well, I don't have figures, Principal Deputy Speaker, suggesting how much money has been spent in different uh, districts. Uh, it certainly is freely available. Um, I just don't happen to have it in front of me. But there's no suggestion that money is only going or is disproportionately going to Belfast. <laughs> Uh, it has certainly gone in past years to each of the 26 districts and has been allocated on the basis of projects which have passed you know, a scoring matrix in order to ensure that there's best value for money. The reality is that even in the tight circumstances of this year where we had slightly less money to spend than we might have hoped, uh, we were able to ensure that each of the projects which passed an appropriate uh, mark was able to be funded. So there is no question of money not going to areas outside Belfast if the projects are good enough. And I call Mr Roy Beggs. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Fuel laundering has been a highly lucrative operation from the, for the criminal gangs involved, uh, involving hundreds of millions of pounds, and yet few, if any, have went to prison, never mind had substantial assets seized. Can the, would the Minister accept that the proportion of assets seized is very, very small in terms of the profits that have been made in this area, and what more does he intend doing to try and uh, help address the issue of illegal uh, fuel laundering? Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, I must congratulate the member for the way in which he managed to extend that question. Uh, the reality is we use the assets which are seized in the best possible way. It is up to the justice agencies which are responsible for seizing those assets to carry those out. But specifically on the topic of fuel laundering, I take it that Mr Beggs is not suggesting that we should sell illegally laundered fuel to people to make a profit from it, because that would be the only way in which we would recover those specific assets. It is unfortunately the case that since so many of the fuel laundering plants are automated without people present, it is very difficult to prosecute individuals even where it's possible to seize the plants. But I do think that you know, 
allowing for those kind of difficulties that the agencies have should not detract from the very good work being done by the Assets Recovery Community Scheme. Thank you. And I call Mr Paul Free. Number three, Mr Dennis. <coughs> Principal Deputy Speaker, my department has contributed approximately £330,000 per annum, or 66% of the total cost, over each of the last three years to the Northern Health and Social Care Trust to run the Railway Street Service in Palomina. Given the changing financial environment, my department first notified trust officials in October of 2013 that funding was at risk. Due to increasing pressures on my budget, notice was given to the trust in October this year that funding would cease at the end of January. We have since secured funding to provide an additional month's cover. No discussions were held with stakeholders prior to the Trust being notified of the decision. The Probation Board, which provides one dedicated member of staff to this project, was advised at the same time as the Northern Trust. Since the Trust was advised of my decision, I have met with Dahi Mackay, MLA, and a delegation which included representation from local GPs, pharmacists, service users and their families, and a union representative. I am due to meet with trust officials later this week to consider whether, whether anything further can be done. This decision, Principal Deputy Speaker, was not an easy one and it was not taken lightly. However, following the significant cuts in funding to the DOJ in year, it has not been possible to continue to protect frontline services. I call Mr Free for supplementary. Sir Deputy, uh, uh, Principal Speaker, would the Minister not agree with me that this is the sort of project and model that is best practice and that will actually save his department money uh, with regards to prison numbers, with regards to crime rates and with regards to social issues within our towns and cities. And would the minister not agree with me that this should be rolled out across the country, not stifled uh, at its inception? Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, clearly the fact that the department funded this project for the last three years is an indication it was seen as a positive uh, project. But I repeat the point I made, in the light of the cuts being made to my department's budget, it is not possible to continue to protect frontline services. Uh, Mr. Fru specifically referred uh, to numbers of prisoners and to crime rates. The reality is that although we have seen a lot of positive work being done by the Railway Street project, crime rates in Ballymena have decreased at a broadly similar rate to crime rates across Northern Ireland. And the numbers of prisoners who might have resulted had there been a slightly higher rate is not, as has been suggested to some people, at a cost of £60,000 per additional person admitted to prison, but the marginal cost of that is significantly less. I, of course, regret cutbacks to frontline projects like this, but faced with the budget cut that the Department of Justice is faced with, there is no choice but to make cuts which will be difficult which will damage community safety and which will reverse many of the advances we've seen over the last four and a half years. I call Mr Dahi Mackay. I'm going to pre last concur. I thank the Minister for his answer. However, like the previous speaker, I am deeply concerned about the effects this cut will have on our constituents, particularly those who are at risk uh, from drug abuse. Can I ask the, the Minister, uh, I'm very grateful for the meeting they had with ourselves, uh, can I ask him in terms of his forthcoming engagement with the Northern Trust? Uh, will he be going into that meeting uh, with a mind of compromise uh, and will he be minded to meet halfway uh, with the health officials to try and ensure that we don't have a 100% cut from the Department of Justice but a, a meaningful compromise is put in place here? Well, I, I appreciate Mr Mackay's reference to his constituents and Mr Frews. I would remind him that the meeting he was at, one of those present, was a constituent of mine. I am entirely aware of the local value of this project. But in terms of the meeting with trust officials, it is to explore what possibilities exist to see whether it is possible to continue this project in a meaningful way. If he asks me to say I will meet halfway, I'm not sure whether that means keeping half of the grant aid. I can make no specific projects, but I'm going in there to see whether it is possible to make any kind of arrangement with the trust. Well, Mr. Robin Swan. Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and, and like other North Antrim reps, I, I, extremely concerned about the removal of this service, which does serve a wide section of our community. Has the Minister approached either the Minister of Health or the Minister of Social Development to see if there's any other match funding, rather than just Justice and the Trust looking to fund this process? Because the knock-on effects of the 260 users of this service re-entering community without that support that has been provided by Railway Street is going to have a knock-on effect to both those departments as well. 
Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, of course, as this project is actually run by the Northern Trust, though two-thirds funded by the Department of Justice, it will be an issue for the Trust to follow up uh, with its parent department, DHS SPS, and not for me as Minister of Justice to follow up there. Uh, that's one of the issues which I may be able to explore later this week. But there are real challenges to see across a range of budget cuts affecting every department, whether it is possible to always prioritise the frontline services that we would wish to prioritise. I call Mr Jim Allister. Minister, is this not a classic invest to save scenario? That by investing this relatively modest amount, you are saving the lives of a number of the drug-dependent people, you are saving the state from the uh, ravages which come from drug-fueled crime, and you are saving the health service from the uh, repeat costs of looking after such people. So is it not time to recognise it is an invest to save and to make the investment? Sadly, Principal Deputy Speaker, there's a lot of preventive work done by my department, which is invest to save, which is going to have to go in the face of the budget cuts imposed on my department. And specifically, Mr. Alistair may make reasonable points about saving the health service or saving lives. Well, specifically, the role of the Department of Justice is not to take over the role of the health service. We are working in partnership at the moment in a number of different areas of which Railway Street Project is but one. But the prioritisation has to ensure that if there are issues of concern to one department, they cannot always be bailed out by another department. I am looking to see what is possible. As I have said to a number of members, uh, we still have two members from North Antrim who have not yet asked questions, but we can, uh, we can only but say difficult times are causing difficult decisions to be taken. I call Mr. Fergal McKinney. Well, <clears throat> Deputy Speaker, and could I just add my uh, voice in terms of supporting the calls for this decision to be reversed, but in this context, and it's reflective of the comments earlier on, that this is marginally small money potted together with other monies producing good outcomes, and isn't the decision around this, like many of the other decisions, consistent merely with bottom line, bottom line and not strategic objectives? In that sense, it's completely counter-strategic, not only to justice outcomes but to health outcomes. I mean no insult to Mr McKinney when I point out that neither he nor anybody else who has spoken on this question has suggested anywhere else where money could be saved. That is the blunt reality of the life that we have to live with. It is fine to talk about benefits in the future by maintaining services today, but if we cannot fund them, we cannot fund them. And it is as simple as that. Whether it is realistic, whether it is sensible, whether it is strategic, whether it is long term, the budget of the Department of Justice, despite being supposedly ring fenced for this year as the end of the four year CSR period, was cut unilaterally in year, and the Department of Justice is living with the consequences. And that is the reality of where we are currently placed. If members wish to go back to the Minister of Finance and Personnel and suggest that the Department of Justice should have its budget restored to the ring fence position we understood, where we were managing the strongest cuts that were happening to any department anyway and not impose further cuts, then I'll happily lead them in a deputation to DFP. Thank you. And uh, Mr David Hildridge is not in his place, so I'll call Mr Leslie Cree. Question five, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. With permission, then, Principal Deputy Speaker, I'll answer questions five and seven together. The National Crime Agency is still prohibited from operating in the devolved arena in Northern Ireland, and as I've stated many times, there's clearly a major gap in our ability to tackle serious and organised crime groups as a result. That is why I, along with the PSNI, the NCA, the NIO, and the Home Office, are making every attempt to resolve the situation. On the 8th of September, I circulated an updated proposal paper to, amongst others, the main political parties, the Justice Committee and the Policing Board, setting out proposals on the accountability of the National Crime Agency, which should, in my view, enable us to achieve the full operation of the agency here. It is a comprehensive proposal which would create clear, transparent and significant local accountability and is a result of extensive work between my department, NCA, PSNI and Home Office, and it has the full commitment of all those bodies. Since then, I've met with all the main parties and I will continue to engage. 
However, as I've said previously, we cannot operate in this situation of limbo indefinitely. If there is no resolution soon, we may have to find a way to work within the present limitations. There is currently a complete absence of civil recovery here in the devolved arena, making Northern Ireland a potentially attractive place for criminals to operate or to keep their assets. There is also an inability to source financial investigation expertise from the NCA where the offences being investigated are devolved, which in turn has hindered a number of investigations, for example on waste crime. The NCA cannot assist the PSNI with, amongst many other things, child exploitation and human trafficking operations, again leaving Northern Ireland at a disadvantage. I would continue to urge all members to work constructively to reach agreement on the current proposal so that our law enforcement agencies and our people can benefit from the skill, the expertise and the resources of the NCA. Thank you and I thank the Minister for a fully comprehensive response. Minister, you, you came close to touching on, on a concern that I have and that is that the recent drugs fine, massive drugs fine that has been uh, discovered suggest to you that there are better opportunities now in Northern Ireland for criminals uh, because the NCA doesn't operate fully in this jurisdiction? Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, we cannot be sure in any specific instance whether the absence of the NCA was a factor, but it is there no doubt that cumulatively, especially at a time of budget restraint, we are losing out by not having the NCA, not least in, this, in the issue of civil recovery of assets, as well as the direct crime-fighting ability it would bring. I call Mr. Raymond McCartney. Thank you very much, Principal Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for his answer. Uh, sometimes people uh, put up this thesis that where the NCA operate, there is, there is no crime, and if only they were here, there would be no crime. Would the Minister be aware of the recent trial where the trial judge described the NCA as incompetent and involved themselves in multiple failures beyond negligence and that they failed to adhere to the protocol principles of disclosure. So would the Minister agree with us the concern that where people feel they're not accountable, they act beyond account? Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, I'm in no position to judge the operation of the NCA across the water. What I am absolutely clear about is that the concerns Mr McCartney has raised about accountability are exactly the reason why, from the very beginning, I have sought to ensure there was proper accountability, there was primacy of the PSNI, that there was a role for the Chief Constable in the approval of operations, uh, that there was a role for the Policing Board, there was a role for the Police Ombudsman in any operation of the NCA here, and that, I believe, would address the kind of concerns which have been raised by Mr McCartney. Mr. Lawrence Kelly. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, the Minister will be aware uh, that there are extensive uh, discussions ongoing in relation to the NCA, in particular around the accountability mechanisms. And would he join with me in uh, acknowledging the uh, the mechanisms which the PSNI would welcome and have and has been stated in their 2013 uh, Human Rights Annual uh, Report as being the minimum standard of accountability that's necessary to move forward. I would certainly welcome the application of those standards which apply to the PSNI to the NCA because the reality is at the moment that the NCA is operating in Northern Ireland in the reserve uh, sphere without any accountability mechanisms whatsoever and that is a further addition which would be given if we had the NCA operation in the devolved sphere. It would then also be accountable in the reserve sphere and indeed uh, for the seizure of assets, a further reason why we need it. Thank you. And I call Mr. Colum Eastwood. Question number six, please. With permission, Principal Deputy Speaker, I'll take questions six and nine together. Members will be aware that I provided a comprehensive update to the Assembly in respect of the stock take report by the independent assessment team in a debate on the 25th of November. The assessors make ten recommendations. Of the nine that fall to the Northern Ireland Prison Service, eight have been fully accepted and one has been partially accepted. One recommendation in respect of criteria for entry into separation is a matter for the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland to consider. I am grateful for the thoroughness and balance of the report, which has now been published along with a detailed response from the Prison Service. I call Mr. Eastwood for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I thank the, the Minister for his answer? Given that we've had some uh, public representatives uh, speaking very negatively about uh, this team, will the Minister? Uh, agree with me that the work that they've done has been very, very valuable 
uh, and it's up now to the rest of us to get uh, this stuff over the line and ensure that we can have no more, uh, no more difficulties in our prisons. Well, I'm grateful to Mr Eastwood for his endorsement of the work of the team. Yes, I believe they have carried out a very valuable function for a significant period of time, not the least in the preparation of this report. That is why, after careful consideration, the prison service has accepted the report uh, in all but one partial respect relating to visits, and I certainly hope that we will see positive responses uh, on all sides to ensure that that work can be carried through in a way which reduces tension in the prison and which ensures that Row House and other parts of McGabry are safe for prisoners, for staff, for visitors and ultimately for the wider community. Mr. Fran McCann, for supplementary. Well, I'm Mila uh, uh, pre last and I thank the Minister uh, for his response thus far. But would the Minister agree that an opportunity now exists to treat everyone with dignity and respect? And would the Minister give an assurance, and I know he said that, that the recommendations have been accepted, but will he give an assurance uh, that it goes one stage fur further and that they are implemented? Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, the recommendations are accepted and are being implemented by the prison service. Uh, Mr McCown quite ri rightly talks about the need for people to be treated with respect, and the most urgent part of that is to see the threats being made against prison officers immediately lifted. Mr Edmund Putz. The last comment <coughs> from the Minister is a very important one because the uh, uh, Director General indicated that one threat may be one too many. And it is absolutely criminal that we are continuing to give these concessions to the prisoners while the threats continue. Will the Minister Ford stand with the Director General in one threat is one threat too many? Or is he so caught up in the spirit of Christmas? That is a minister who just keeps giving when it comes to prisoners and Republican prisoners. I seriously wonder for the second time today, Principal Deputy Speaker, whether Mr Poots actually listened to what I just said. Because I made it absolutely clear what was required to show respect. And I made it absolutely clear that I stand with the Director General and the Prison Service in implementing the recommendations to ensure that prisons are safe places. And that requires action by those who are currently making threats to stop making threats, just the same as it requires management change in terms of some of the administrative issues and the management issues around Row House. Thank you. And I call Mr John Dallet. To number eight. The Northern Ireland Prison Service is committed to creating and sustaining an environment where everyone is treated with respect and dignity, free from any form of inappropriate behaviour. Prison service staff are supported in challenging any unwanted, unreasonable or offensive conduct and procedures are in place to enable them to do so. All incidents of bullying and harassment by prison staff towards other prison employees reported under these procedures are captured and recorded. Such incidents are treated seriously and dealt with in accordance with the Civil Service Dignity at Work policy. During the period April 2012 to November 2014, there were 20 reported incidents of bullying and harassment, 15 were resolved informally, one was withdrawn and four resulted in a formal investigation. This is a low level of complaints when set in the context of a workforce of just over 1,800 staff, though all must be treated seriously. Mr Dallet, for supplement. Is the Minister seriously dismissing my question by claiming that bullying within the prison service is at such a low level, and could he explain why several hundred uh, prison officers are off suffering from anxiety, and many of them claiming it is not the prisoners that have done it? Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, if individuals have concerns, they need to be formally reported in a way that they can be investigated, and not merely raised in an anonymous way, for example, on the floor of this chamber. There are proper procedures which should be put into place, and I would urge anyone with concerns to use those proper procedures. Thank you. On, uh, that ends the period for listed questions, and we now move on to topical questions. And before I call Mr uh, Swan, could I just uh, inform members that topicals 2, 6 and 7 have been withdrawn within the, uh, the allotted time frame. So, Mr Robin Swan. Thank you very much, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, the Minister is aware that clay pigeon target shooting has been waiting for many years for justice for young people in Northern Ireland to give them the quality of opportunity for their peers in the rest of the UK. 
Could you give us an update of where you are in that legislation? Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, um, I have certainly stated an intention as part of general reforms around firearms to lower the age at which young people can be permitted access to shotguns in certain circumstances. The proposals have been published. There have been a number of discussions which are ongoing, including quite recently. Um, ideally, we need to reach a consensus about a number of issues relating to firearms before progress can be made. But certainly, I am fully aware and indeed have met some of those young people who have been able to represent Northern Ireland outside Northern Ireland, but not within Northern Ireland. And I recognise the concerns which have been uh, produced by the Clay Pigeon Shooting Association, amongst others. On for supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Principal. Uh, and the Minister, I know, has acknowledged the problem. But the pro where the concern is, is around that consensus of a number of issues. The other issues are holding this one exact issue back. When will the Minister actually move forward and make a decision, even subordinate or outside the other decisions coming to fruition? Principal Deputy Speaker, would that it were that simple. Uh, the reality is that anything we would be looking at would require primary legislation. And before we could engage in primary legislation, we would need to ensure that we had all the relevant issues relating to firearms considered together. It would be impossible to, you know, to simply produce um, legislation around this one specific issue. And as yet, unfortunately, there is no consensus amongst the shooting organisations, uh, never mind with the PSNI or with the DOJ, as to the appropriate way to move forward. Thank you. And I call Ms Maeve McLaughlin. Um, and whilst it, it's appreciated that the, the relevant uh, events occurred some time ago before the ministers, the current ministers, watch, but given the significance of the revelation that the former Secretary of State, Marilyn Rees, informed the British Prime Minister in 1977 that Tory ministers had authorised methods of torture here in the North. Will the Minister now give assurances to this House that he will guarantee full disclosure of any information held by his department and full cooperation with the case of the hooded men that has recently been taken back to the European Court? Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, I am certainly not sure that I have a role in the current dispute at the European Court between Ireland and the United Kingdom. Um, I am happy uh, to give a guarantee that if any information is held by my department which may be relevant to historic matters, it is made available in accordance with court requirements. I am fairly sure that that does not apply in this case. Ms McLaughlin for supplementary. Good. And I thank the Minister for his answer and indeed for the guarantee of cooperation. However, can I ask, in light of, of the revelations, does the Minister now agree that the British Government here have a responsibility to ensure comprehensive resources are available to this executive to deal with legacy issues. I suspect if we're going to take that question much further, Principal Deputy Speaker, Ms McLaughlin and I should both be down in Stormont House rather than standing in the chamber. Uh, I certainly believe that there are very significant issues relating to legacy which were not dealt with fully a year ago when Richard Haas convened the talks which it now appears are being dealt with in a more comprehensive and joined up way in the talks uh, which we expect to see led later this week by the Prime Minister and the Taoiseach. I will certainly do my best, though I don't answer here as leader of my party, but also as Minister of Justice to ensure that we reach a comprehensive agreement and ensures adequate funding for the justice system to deal through appropriate issues with, uh, with the matters that have arisen in the past which are currently creating difficulties for the justice system today. Thank you. And I call Mr. Stephen Moutry. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Can the Minister indicate what measures have been brought about to reduce the legal aid bill that we currently have? Um, I'm sure members of the House are aware of a fair a bit of work which has been done around the cost of legal aid over, frankly, almost the entire period since I became Minister, the first of which was reducing significantly Crown Court fees and introducing standard fees which has resulted in a saving of in excess of £20 million. There has been further reform around other minor criminal matters, and work is ongoing at the moment to examine the scope for legal aid and alternative methods of providing legal assistance where required in a number of civil cases. It is absolutely clear that the budget for legal aid 
has been exceeded every year for many years and unfortunately continues to be exceeded in a way which is damaging to the rest of the budget of the justice system. Mutri for supplementary. I thank the Minister for his response. Uh, will the Minister today give a commitment to the House that he will see that the cost of legal aid is reduced before he impacts services like policing and prison service? Well, unfortunately, Principal Deputy Speaker, whilst I suspect most of the House would probably agree with Mr Moutre, if there are legal obligations to pay legal aid to solicitors and barristers at the rates currently set by statute, it's not possible to say that those will simply not be paid uh, in the interest of defending other services. Um, I'm sure that most members of this House would wish to see funding for issues like policing, community safety, youth justice, even probation service um, funded ahead of legal aid. The reality is that there are contractual obligations which have to be met as we seek to uh, produce those reforms. I welcome the fact that uh, just in October, I got agreement from the Justice Committee to a further £4 million reduction in the legal aid bill. Unfortunately, it took many months to get that agreement from the committee, and we will need to see movement much quicker if we're to deal with the problem of excessive legal aid spending compared to other jurisdictions and to ensure that we can redirect funding to the services that we would all wish to see funded. Thank you. And I call Mr Trevor Lunn. Uh, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Could I ask the Minister what, what is his view? of the importance of the talks process, producing a package of measures to deliver truth, justice and services for victims? Well, certainly, Principal Deputy Speaker, as Minister of Justice, I see every day the impact that the legacy of the past has on the operation of the justice system today. There is no doubt that the, uh, the pressures which apply on the police service are exacerbated by the large amount of historical work which is having to be done by the PSNI previously within the HET, but members will be aware of restructuring reforms going ahead there. There is similarly a pressure of the past on the police ombudsman, and the fact that we now have a very significant number of legacy inquests ordered is adding further. All of that is making difficulties for the justice system in dealing with the needs of the present. The work which is being done by the justice system around the needs of victims is largely concentrated on that for the present. But there are certainly uh, possibilities from the talks which are going on between the parties which would see work being done around truth recovery, which would, would allow information retrieval in a way which would be of benefit to victims. And certainly there are further issues which need to be addressed there about <coughs> services for victims, which go a little bit beyond my direct responsibilities in the justice system. Commissioner Lund for supplementary. Yes, I thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer. Could, could I ask him for his assessment of the consequences of failing to agree a new fully funded and Article 2 compliant system for dealing with the past? Well, I know my colleague has particular interest and concerns about one uh, group of bereaved families, the Ballamurphy Massacre Group. There is no doubt that whilst they are currently close to seeing in inquests happening into the deaths of their loved ones, that there are many others who are further back in the queue, who are unlikely to see inquests on the current basis being called for many years with all the dangers that that has in terms of causing further distress and upset to victims. That's why I think it's urgent that we use the proposals for what Richard has called the Historical Investigations Unit, and I don't particularly mind what it's called, to ensure that it not only does the investigations into the past, but it also then leads to in seeing that the truth is recovered and publicly tested for the benefit of bereaved families so that they can get past the current blockage of not seeing inquests happening. Thank you. And I call Mr Adrian McQuillan. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister, in light of the Minister's stark warning of what effect the cuts to his budget is going to have a detrimental impact on policing, does he agree with me that PCSPs have delivered very little and perhaps this is where we should be cutting? Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, I think it is fair to say that some PCSPs have been better than others in terms of the work that's been done. Um, I actually think by what I have seen on a number of visits to uh, the four PCSPs in the future Causeway area, with Limavady, Coleraine, Balamani and Moyle uh, cooperating together, that there's been very, some very good work done, particularly in addressing issues of concern to young people about car crash simulation and also a recent play which I saw performed in Bush Mills. Uh, relating to the problems of underage drinking. So it is clear that in many cases PCSPs are doing good work. It's also clear that in some areas there have been greater difficulties in getting the arrangements joined up. 
and we haven't yet seen the full benefits of bringing DPPs and CSPs together, which was what was envisaged when we passed the Justice Act in 2011. I think it is a challenge, and I certainly hope that the work being done by my officials with PCSP managers will ensure that we see an improvement so that all of them live up to the current standards of the best. Mr McQuillan for supplementary. Thank you, Principal. Deputy Speaker, I thank the Minister for his answer so far. Minister, can you ensure that at least the administration costs of 43% can be brought into line with the public sector of around 20%? Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, that is clearly an issue for the PCSPs themselves to address, and clearly there will be a role for new councils to address. I have no doubt that given that we are talking about a smaller number of larger councils, there ought to be economies of scale which reduce those administration costs. I suspect that to some extent there may be um, some slight difficulties, and in some cases that issues may be presented as administration costs which are actually funding council staff or PCSP staff engaging in full-time frontline work with communities around uh, safety issues in particular and addressing the fear of crime. Nonetheless, it all tends to get wrapped up as administration. So there may be work being done which is funded by salaries as opposed to project money, which is being counted as administration and isn't. But the important thing is that people do cut down on the administration costs and ensure that as much as possible of the funding for PCSPs goes into providing direct services, whether by staff or by others. Thank you. And call Mr. Colin Eastwood. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister uh, what impact the budget cuts will have on the court service and uh, the closure of courthouses in particular? At the moment, the specific issue of courthouses is under consideration. Proposals have been developed. Members will be aware that there are already proposals uh, to close Macrofelt and Limavady uh, hearing centres on the basis of court uh, boundary revisions being put through. But the reality is that there are major issues around the, the current running of the court system, which in some cases are costing money to provide relatively elderly facilities, which are in some cases not disability uh, friendly, uh, which uh, cause concerns in terms of the overall running costs. And there may well be a case for rationalisation of the court estate to ensure that better services are provided in a smaller number of modern courthouses rather than the large number of older buildings which don't meet the needs of the 21st century. And I call Mr Eastwood for a supplementary. Thank you. Um, th is the Minister confident, though, that this rationalisation can be carried out uh, without creating uh, long delays in the system and without uh, impact on people's access to justice? Well, it's a perfectly reasonable question for Mr Eastwood. Um, I do believe that there are issues which say if we concentrate on a smaller number of courthouses, it may well be possible to ensure that we cut out some of the delays. Um, if, for example, we have a greater number of staff working in a group, even at times the ability to provide a deputy judge if a judge is sick may be enhanced by having a smaller number of venues uh, which provide uh, greater economies of scale. But that is the amount of detail which is currently being worked through by my staff, and there will be proposals put forward on that. Thank you. And uh, as Mr Dominic Bradley is not in his place, uh, can I uh, congratulate the Minister for working his way through the remainder of his list of topical questions? And thank him very much. And I suggest as uh, the next session, even though the Minister very commendably as early. Uh, we have to wait until 2.45, which is the time allotted by the Business Committee, so the House will take its ease until then.